This is John Weigelt, your coordinating editor for CSAP 17 Audio Companion. I'm sitting here today with Dr. Jim Valentine, one of our CSAP 17 authors, to speak with me. Jim, can you share with our audience where you're located, your primary focus of your clinical practice, and maybe a little about how you spend your usual day, if you really have one of those? (laughs) Fair enough. Uh, I'm currently a full professor of of vascular surgery at the University of Minnesota Medical Center. I have a purely academic vascular surgery practice and currently serve as the program director of both an integrated and an independent vascular training program. My usual day is rounding and either participating in the operating room or clinic or running teaching conferences. Uh, It's a very full week. Well, thanks for that intro, and I have asked you to share some of your thoughts about various conditions a surgeon faces concerning questions from CSAP-17 that are found in the vascular category. Some of the topics uh, come directly from CSAP-17 questions, uh, and others I have pulled out of my memory as we have gone through the process for CSAP-17 regarding questions that many of the committees talked about that uh, may not have been selected for the final draft of CSAP-17. So I hope to pick your brain about many of these uh, in your specific area of expertise. So why don't we start at the top of the body and work our way distally? That, that's always good for vascular problems. So let's talk about carotid disease. From a diagnostic standpoint, what's needed today before you recommend any intervention? Well, I think at the top of the decision tree should be um, a history and physical examination, particularly looking for the presence of symptoms. TIAs or strokes are pretty specific in the anterior cerebral circulation and really boil down to amaurosis fugax, hemiplegia um, or hemisensory loss or occasionally expressive aphasia. So I specifically ask for those symptoms first. Okay, and when when you're done with that, do you use any specific diagnostic imaging as your first step always? I usually go to a carotid duplex ultrasound study. Now, the quality of the study really depends on the vascular lab, and each lab may use its own criteria to judge the degree of carotid stenosis. The Intersocietal Accreditation Commission, or IAC, accredited labs are required to have ongoing quality assessment of their results by comparing them with fixed imaging studies such as carotid arteriograms or CT angiograms. In general, I rely on the findings of the vascular lab at the University of um, Minnesota, except in circumstances when the data are conflicting, such as high flow velocities in a carotid artery that has a minimal carotid plaque or extensive calcification with the inability to look inside the plaque to look at the degree of stenosis based on velocity criteria. In those cases, I usually send the patient for a CT angiogram. So have you cut out the radiologist or from the angiographic diagnosis of this disease? In general, uh, we don't usually use carotid angiography unless we're going to go ahead and consider a carotid sensing procedure. Occasionally, I have recommended carotid angiography, which I do myself, if I really can't determine the degree of stenosis based on CT angiography, MR angiography, carotid duplex scanning, or if there is discrepant results between two or more tests. So generally speaking, it's it's not in the uh, diagnostic workup anymore. So since you mentioned symptoms to begin with, so for a symptomatic carotid stenosis, What is the finding on ultrasound that would make you go to the operating room? In general, a patient who is truly symptomatic, uh, who has a greater than 50% carotid stenosis by duplex study, uh, would be a person I would consider taking to the operating room. That's based on old data from the NASIT study from the 1990s, which originally looked at the 70 to 99% range, but in subsequent uh, studies found that intervention was important in patients with a 50 to 70% if the surgeon had good uh, operative outcomes in terms of uh, stroke risk. 
And what about the asymptomatic patient with a stenotic lesion? Well, the ACAS study that was a parallel study done also in the 90s in asymptomatic patients suggests that there is a benefit of carotid endarterectomy in asymptomatic patients with a 60% stenosis or titer. However, the accuracy of the duplex ultrasonography test is somewhat decreased between 50 and 60% narrowed lesions. And so I personally reserve recommendations for intervention in patients with a greater than 80% stenosis by duplex criteria. My criteria are based on the University of Washington or strandness criteria, uh, looking at flow velocities, not ratios, and not um, estimates of less than 80%. Now, I also have noticed that there's some controversy about all those numbers based upon the fact that we now have more medical interventions for patients with carotid disease, uh, including statins. Uh, how, how does that play into your discussion with a patient today? That's a great point. All of the studies that we that I just talked about, the NASA study, the ACAS study, and the studies that preceded those, were all based on best medical management really just being aspirin alone. The introduction of statins occurred after those studies, and those may have a more salutary effect on lesion uh, stability than even aspirin. I think we are going to learn more about this when the new uh, CREST-2 trial comes out probably in the next one to two years. The CREST-2 trial has a medical treatment arm that includes statins, and we may be able to ferret out the long-term stroke risk in patients with asymptomatic stenoses who are now on best medical therapy, which may be better than it was back in the 1990s. So, but currently you're using the data as you gave them to us when you have that discussion with your patients? Yes, that's the best data we have. Okay. All right, so then the other question that I know is always on a surgeon's mind, has stenting overtaken open carotid endarterectomy? I think carotid endarterectomy is still considered the gold standard by most vascular surgeons. Carotid stenting does have a place, particularly in patients with serious medical comorbidities, such as congestive heart failure or advanced COPD. Uh, It also may have a place in difficult surgical problems, such as recurrent plaques or previously radiated necks. The result of the CREST-1 trial probably provide us with the best current information Basically, carotid stenting was equivalent therapy to carotid endarterectomy in patients who were considered at higher risk. However, the stent patients had a slightly higher incidence of stroke, while the endarterectomy patients had a slightly higher MI rate. Now, there's a new hybrid stenting procedure known as TCAR, which stands for transcarotid artery revascularization, that has shown promise in reducing the strokes associated with stenting, even though there was just a slightly increased stroke risk in in the CREST trial, it was still higher compared to the carotid endarterectomy patients. In TCAR, the common carotid artery is exposed in a small low neck incision just above the clavicle for placement of a sheath. The sheath is advanced into the common carotid artery but below the bifurcation, and then the sheath is hooked to a filtered circuit that empties blood into the femoral vein that creates a reversible flow in the internal carotid artery. The carotid stent is then introduced through the carotid sheath and the deployment is performed without risk of causing distal embolization because the flow is reversed. Early results from TCAR trials are very promising with reported stroke rates that are lower than that was reported in the CREST trial. The main advantage of the procedure is that it avoids instrumentation of the aortic arch, which of course is required in the transfemoral approach used in traditional stenting procedures. And, of course, as we mentioned, it allows reversible flow that prevents embolic uh, occlusion uh, into the internal carotid circulation. And so, therefore, you don't need to put an embolic protection device into the internal carotid artery. I'm just amazed how you guys come up with something new almost every time we talk about vascular disease. You mentioned the umbrella or the filter. So most stenting is, is never done without that being present, correct? In the traditional stenting procedures, meaning from the from the femoral artery, that's correct. Embolic protection devices are considered standard of care. Well, let's move down a little bit on the body, and let's talk about aortic disease. 
there seems to be a general consensus in many communities that health fairs that screening for aortic disease, abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, especially, is pretty common. Is this something that is appropriate? Uh, is it helpful or is it fraught with a lot of false positives? Well, let me say this. Community-based screening of unselected populations, any population that walks into a, a fair, is not productive or cost-effective. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force that um, makes recommendations that uh, Medicare usually follows recommends a one-time screening for abdominal aortic aneurysm by ultrasonography in men who are 65 to 75 years of age who have ever smoked. Detection and management of aneurysms more than five and a half centimeters in this group has led to a decrease in aneurysm-specific mortality. So this is the only population that probably should be screened. That's a male population. Uh, so we're leaving the females out of this discussion? Apparently so. This is what the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommended. Uh, you're going to have to talk to them, Jim. I mean, that's not, <laughs> that's not the way we function these days, I thought. so. Well, now you mentioned the size of the aneurysm. So from a standpoint of a patient, if I get screened and I find that I've got a five centimeter aneurysm, what am I supposed to do about it or what am I recommended to do about it? Well, five centimeters in a male um, is below the accepted threshold for intervention. And so what I would do in that case is probably bring you back in six months and repeat the ultrasound test and see if there's been an increase to five and a half centimeters or larger. For females, the evidence is a little bit less uh, available, but we assume that the female aorta is smaller than the male aorta, and so therefore we generally use five centimeters as a threshold for intervention in females, much as we would use five and a half centimeters for intervention in, in males. Okay, so let's talk about a healthy 68-year-old uh, with a 5.5 centimeter aortic aneurysm. Uh, tell us what the discussion in your office with that patient would, might be regarding what to do next. All things being equal, I would recommend having an intervention to repair the aneurysm. And the obvious question is, whether this would be recommended as an endovascular-based procedure known as an EVAR or endovascular aneurysm repair, or whether this should be done open. I look at the two procedures as having trade-offs. In general, patients who undergo EVAR have a much shorter hospital stay and re can return to their usual lifestyle much faster than those who undergo open surgery. On the other hand, EVAR is associated with a higher risk of graft-related complications in the uh, subsequent years, such as need for reintervention, and even has a risk of late rupture. The late rupture risk has been quoted as as high as 1% per year. And although the devices are getting better, we're still seeing patients with the older devices who are lost to follow-up who come in with a lot of these complications. A large amount of evidence has been accumulated from randomized trials that show an initial overall survival benefit for EVAR and some trials, uh, particularly those in Europe, show that the, the survival difference is maintained after two years, whereas others show that the survival difference is no longer significant compared to open repair in the second year after the EVAR procedure. So in that young, healthy patient, are you uh, recommending an open or the endovascular approach? Well, again, this really comes down to a discussion with the patient. And I think you really have to look at the patient. In a young, fit patient, and, and the definition of youth, in my experience, changes every year. But if I see a person who's less than 60 years of age, we might favor an open repair because of the better durability. On the other hand, a patient with significant comorbidities or a prior history of transperitoneal procedures might be a better candidate for EVAR. But an equally important consideration is to consider the aneurysm anatomy because we have to determine whether that anatomy is suitable for an endovascular repair. And that would include the length, geometry, angulation, and amount of thrombus in the aortic neck, whether or not there's adequate access vessels to accommodate delivery devices, in other words, whether the femoral and external iliac arteries are large enough to accommodate those large sheaths, 
in the presence of other confounding factors such as accessory renal arteries and so forth. Finally, assuming that the patient is a candidate for either procedure, the final decision really comes down to what the patient wants, and it's important to present as an unbiased view as possible uh, at the time of the discussion. In general, I try to tell the patient that they're eligible for either procedure to make up their minds, but I want them to understand that the trade-offs are significant, as we talked about. Okay, so once again, it's a discussion between patient and and doctor, as uh, we all know, uh, to make that final decision. Well, let me ask regarding after an open repair, that patient comes in, let's say, eight years later, everything's been going well, but they all of a sudden come in with a massive upper GI bleed. And the question is, that has been posed to you by the admitting physician is, could this be an aortoduodenal fistula? And uh, how do you go about proving or disproving that? Well, it certainly could be. And um, I think these days, the first test that we would recommend is probably a CT angiogram. Whereas uh, we would have recommended an upper endoscopy in the past, Apparently, upper endoscopy misses up to 40% of aortoduodenal fistulas. And aortoduodenal fistula on CT angiogram has certain remarkable characteristics, such as the presence of a graft infection or air around the graft, loss of a plane between the duodenum and the aorta. All of those things would be highly suspicious for an aortoduodenal fistula. And it would also give us some anatomic information that might be helpful if the patient needed to have a, a, an emergency operation to uh, repair uh, the aorta duodenal fistula and replace the graft. In general, I would recommend an upper endoscopy as a secondary diagnostic test if the CT angiogram does not look as though there's an aortoenteric fistula because there could be other sources of upper GI bleeding such as ulcer disease, uh, esophageal varices, and so forth. So essentially the CTA has become your go-to test to make this diagnosis? Yes. Okay. All right. So once the diagnosis is made, is, is this a mandate for an extra anatomical bypass and removal of the infected graft? Well, there are many options to care for patients with aortoenteric fistulas. The most important thing to consider are the state of the patient at the time of the diagnosis and the degree of graft contamination. In general, extra-anatomic bypass, such as an AXFEM-FEM, followed by graft excision and duodenal repair is acceptable in patients who do not have graft infections that extend to the groin. We tend to stage these operations, if at all possible, with the extra-anatomic bypass performed first. Considering the reduced patency of the AXFEM grafts and the concern for aortic stump blowout, we and others have favored direct graft excision, repair of the enterotomy, and replacement with a new graft. Some vascular surgeons use antibiotic-soaked Dacron, but these surgeons have to accept a reinfection rate of 20%. They, they still might be adequate to use if there's minimal contamination uh, and the, the aorta duodenal fistula is very uh, limited just to the anastomotic area. Other surgeons prefer to use cryopreserved allografts or cadaver grafts, which seemed acceptable in modern practice. Uh, we think that the uh, recent preservation techniques have improved the long-term patency of these grafts, which used to be fraught with uh, pseudoaneurysms presenting late, but we haven't seen that since the preservation techniques have changed. Because the allografts are not often immediately available, we and others have used the femoral popliteal vein to replace the infected graft. These grafts have shown excellent uh, resistance to all kinds of infection, and the long-term patency rates are excellent. However, the um, operations are long, and they're certainly not appropriate for sick patients. I would mention, though, that there may be a place for endovascular grafts in patients with aortoenteric fistulas. In general, endografts are not considered to be long-term solutions to treat aortoenteric fistulas, as there's a very high rate of recurrence but they can be used as a stopgap in an actively hemorrhaging patient or one who has severe correctable comorbidities, which might allow you the time to stabilize the patient or better prepare him or her for a more invasive procedure in days to weeks. I presented you with a 
patient after an open AAA repair, and the thought just crossed my mind, is this a complication that is unique to open, or has it been reported with endovascular repairs? It is not unique to open, and it has been reported in patients with endovascular, after endovascular repair, and particularly it's uh, a high uh, prevalence of aorta and fistulas in patients who develop graft infections of their EVARs. And that leads me to my next question, because I know you've had some interest in graft infections throughout your career. So when a general surgeon is choosing a vascular graft, it, have we made any progress to identify one type that's more resistant to infection than others? In general terms, um, using autogenous tissue is always better. We've known that for many, many years since the original work from Stoney and his group in California recognized that you can replace an infected prosthetic fem pop with uh, saphenous vein. Um, because of the size discrepancy, we would favor using uh, femoral popliteal vein uh, in that position, and that, again, seems to be the most resistant of all. Many, many people, though, have moved to using cryopreserved allograft, as we mentioned, the cadaver arteries. And in relatively short follow-up, less than five years, it seems that those grafts are very durable. The problem with the patients who have aortoenteric fistulas is that the mortality rate is very, very high, unrelated to the aortic complications, often due to comorbid patient diseases. The five-year survival rate of these patients is dismal, somewhere around 20%. Let's move a little further down, and let's talk about acute mesenteric ischemia. Can or should we be able to tell a patient with an SMA embolus from a patient with in situ thrombosis? Well, to begin with, let me just state that thrombotic occlusion is now much more common than embolic occlusion in modern series of acute mesenteric ischemia. And I think you can tell the difference between the two clinically, radiologically, and intraoperatively. Clinically, patients with, with thrombotic occlusion might have antecedent symptoms of chronic mesenteric ischemia like postpandial abdominal pain, food fear, and weight loss, while those with embolic occlusion have sudden onset of abdominal pain without antecedent symptoms. So that would be a clinical way to differentiate the two. Radiologically, thrombotic occlusions usually occur near the origin of the superior mesenteric artery, while embolic occlusion occurs more distally, usually at a branch point. Intraoperatively, patients with thrombotic occlusions tend to have ischemic changes involving the entire small bowel and right colon, while those with embolic occlusions might have sparing of the most proximal jejunum because the embolus lodges at a branch point and spares some of the most proximal jejunal branches. Now, the other thing that seems to always come up at M&M conference is non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia and whether we can diagnose that or not. What is it and how should we go about diagnosing it? Well, that's a great question. Non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia, of course, is um, an intestinal low flow state, usually associated with pump failure. It's seen most commonly in patients with severe cardiac failure, and particularly those who have recently undergone cardiac surgery. The issue is that most of these patients do not have pre-existing embolic or thrombotic occlusions, and much of the disease process seems to be due to mesenteric vasospasm, that may be a, a physiologic response to a low flow state in an attempt to maintain blood flow to the cerebral and cardiac circulations by shifting the blood flow away from the mesenteric circulation. In the past, non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia was uh, much more frequent and was often observed in patients who received digitalis. The prevalence has decreased particularly in, in my career along with decreased use of digoxin in these patients. It's now more commonly seen in patients with decreased intravascular volume, such as those on high doses of diuretics and those on hemodialysis. Diagnosis is very difficult, and it's not usually uh, made based on a CT angiogram. Uh, it may be suspected on a CT angiogram due to poor visualization of the SMA branches, but it should be confirmed on a catheter arteriogram, which also can be used for 
temporary improvement of the mesenteric circulation. The main focus of treatment is to reverse the low flow state. In most cases, this includes fluid resuscitation and cardiac support to increase the pump function. The use of inotropes can be necessary, obviously, to support cardiac function, but high doses can certainly contribute to the vasospasm and worsen the ongoing mesenteric ischemia. Although there has not been any uh, randomized trials, some benefit can be gained from temporary infusion of vasodilators through a catheter directly parked into the superior mesenteric artery. This is temporizing and should definitely be used at the same time that the underlying low flow state is being corrected. So medical therapy is going to take care of most of our cases of non-inclusive mesenteric ischemia that we successfully treat. Fair statement? Yes. The question about valve viability always remains, and patients who have prolonged mesenteric ischemia or those particularly with symptoms of uh, peritoneal irritation should be evaluated in the operating room for um, small bowel injury. And with in situ thrombosis, is that something that is managed operatively, endovascularly, or medically? Well, in situ thrombosis uh, is a little bit more difficult compared to embolic occlusion. In patients with thrombotic acute mesenteric ischemia, preliminary endovascular repair might be desirable if it avoids the need to place a graft in a patient who might have gangrenous bowel. Placement of an SMA stent, if you can get it in there, um, with restitution of flow can be done quickly, but the patient probably will still need to have an exploratory laparotomy to assess the bowel viability. The main problem with this approach is that the SMA might not be readily accessible due to chronic thrombotic occlusion at the orifice. And so it's difficult to get into the into that chronically occluded superior mesenteric artery from uh, a remote site, either the brachial artery or the femoral artery. Now, in some cases, a hybrid approach might work best. In a patient with thrombotic occlusion whose peritoneal cavity is already opened, a stent can be placed retrograde directly through the SMA. This will require fixed imaging in a hybrid room and may be somewhat inconvenient, but it's very, very quick and it works very, very well. Uh, We actually did one the other night with an excellent outcome in a patient uh, who had thrombotic mesenteric ischemia. Well, that brings me uh, to a question that arose during discussion of acute mesenteric ischemia by many of the CSAP committees, and that is, let's take the SMA embolus. You make a diagnosis, and the question is, do I look at the bowel first? Do I take care of the vascular problem first. You mentioned a hybrid room. How do we do this? Usually it was the general surgeon who took the patient to the operating room, removed dead bowel, and then found the problem, and the vascular surgeon would come in. Has that changed? Well, I think restitution of arterial flow is necessary to salvage as much bowel as possible, particularly the bowel that's on the edge of the ischemic area and may be uh, at risk for further problems if the circulation is not restored promptly. In general, I recommend promptly restoring blood flow before the bowel resection, but in many cases, we're asked to come to the operating room after the bowel has already been resected, so that horse is out of the barn. SMA embolectomy is particularly fast and should not take more than an hour in most hands. So... Maybe we should rethink some of our classic approaches to this problem. Well, I I don't have clear evidence because there's no clear, there's certainly no prospective study, but it makes sense that restoring flow to the uh, marginally ischemic bowel would preserve that, whereas um, waiting um, while the bowel is resected to see if it pinks up after the flow is restored uh, just doesn't make much sense. So the, the quote... Expiration for dead bowel should be secondary to restoration of blood flow to the bowel, if you want an ideal approach. I think that would be a fair statement. Okay. All right. That was the general consensus of most of your CSAP committee colleagues, so uh, it was very interesting anyway. I have a related topic because most of these patients end up getting some kind of dilode, uh, and I'm sure you you have already mentioned CTAs. So 
Do you have anything that you do in your patient population to reduce the risk of acute kidney injury from the dilode? Uh, in general, all patients undergoing CT angiograms at our institution have a preliminary serum creatinine determination, and that's done very, very quickly. Those with normal creatinine levels are encouraged to drink extra water up to two hours before the CT angiogram, and then after the CT angiogram, they're encouraged to drink extra water for the rest of the day. Those with creatinines greater than 2.0 are reevaluated and considered for other tests such as duplex ultrasonography or non-contrast CT scans. Those with elevated creatinines between 1 and 2 are scheduled for pre-procedure infusion therapy in an infusion clinic. They receive 400 cc's of normal saline over 90 minutes before the test. And all patients undergoing infusion therapy are scheduled for repeat serum creatinines two to three days uh, post-procedure. Rarely in a patient who has a creatinine greater than 2, we will override the algorithm and recommend to go ahead and proceed with the CT angiogram or, or arteriogram. In that case, we try to limit the dye and we try to make sure that the timing is, is accurate to have the test run in a single run. Now, you mentioned having them drink water. You make them drink water or you at least give them some kind of electrolyte solution? In our protocol, the patients with normal creatinine just drink water. Water, okay, all right. But the ones with abnormal creatinines will get normal saline solution as an IV solution. We don't have a question this time on acute venous mesenteric ischemia and CSAP-17, but do you have any comments uh, about this condition, which uh, I'm sure you see some of? Well, um, it's estimated that acute venous mesenteric ischemia accounts for about 10% of mesenteric ischemia cases. The primary type is spontaneous and idiopathic. In patients with any condition that predispose to uh, the venous mesenteric uh, ischemia are considered to have a secondary form. And there are three general underlying conditions. A direct injury, such as trauma, pancreatitis, or inflammatory bowel disease, local venous congestion or stasis in patients with portal hypertension, obesity, or abdominal compartment syndrome, and then the dreaded thrombophilia. Most of the patients who we see get absolutely worked up for hypercoagulable states as an underlying uh, possibility because those patients have to be treated for life with anticoagulation. Typically, a middle-aged patient with a personal or family history of DVT who develops abdominal pain over several days associated with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal distension is, is considered for this diagnosis. The diagnosis is made on a CT um, angiogram on the venous phase, which shows the classic target sign of the superior mesenteric vein or portal vein that's pretty obvious on the, on the scan. The patients in whom the diagnosis is made are admitted to the hospital and started on uh, continuous anticoagulation with unfractionated heparin and fluid resuscitation. And fluid resuscitation can be massive in these patients because there's a lot of edema in, in the bowel wall. Long-term management requires lifelong anticoagulation due to the reported recurrence rate of more than 30%. And both warfarin and the direct oral anticoagulants have been used. I don't believe that there's any evidence supporting one over the other, so probably one of the oral anticoagulants, the direct acting oral anticoagulants, might be more convenient and better to be used. Now, in cases where a patient has clinical deterioration on medical therapy, endovascular therapy has been used to clear the superior mesenteric vein and portal veins of thrombus. This is most successful when done as a TIPS procedure, where the catheter is introduced to the hepatic veins, pushed through the hepatic parenchyma and into the portal system, and then mechanical or suction thrombectomy or lytic therapy is used to clear the thrombus out of there. However, these techniques are associated with an increased risk of bleeding complications. Indirect lytic therapy through the SMA really doesn't seem to be uh, very successful. It's certainly more time-consuming and associated with an even greater risk of bleeding, so we don't do that as a rule. Patients who develop peritonitis should undergo exploratory laparotomy and resection of all necrotic bowel. That was very good, Jim. It uh, gives us a, a good idea of what what to expect. And uh, they're never easy patients to manage, I, I, I would say that, and I bet everybody agrees. How about let's move down a little bit, and general surgeons are still 
pretty much involved with amputations, especially for diabetic foot infections. And uh, we have one question exploring the acute management, calling for sharp debridement. Uh, but let me let me switch the scenario a little bit. And what if the patient has a severe infection of the foot, cellulitis coming up? above the ankle and has a non-reconstructable vascular system. He needs an amputation. Going back in our literature, we can find one stage, two stage, three stage, maybe four stage. I, I don't know. But uh, what do you recommend in that situation? Well, in the patient you described with a severe life-threatening foot infection and a non-reconstructable chronic occlusive disease scenario, the most important consideration is to control the infection. We normally see these in patients with brittle diabetes, and um, a lot of uh, the systemic effects um, will be seen associated with sepsis, and that needs to be controlled very quickly. For many years, we performed below knee amputations in this situation in two stages, and the best evidence uh, for this was reported in a paper by Fisher way back in 1988. In the first stage, uh, an amputation is performed in the so-called guillotine style at the level of the ankle, and the foot is simply removed. We don't even have to get above the level of the infection, but we have to get the infected source off. The patient is then given IV antibiotics, fluids, and other supporting mechanisms for three to five days, and then as a second stage, a formal below-the-knee amputation is performed with primary closure of the skin. In the original series of 47 patients that was reported in the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 1988, those who had a two-stage procedure had no wound complications compared to a 20% incidence of wound infection in those who underwent the one-stage procedure where the skin was left open, and many of those patients had to be converted to an above-the-knee amputation. So based strictly on that paper, our standard of care is to recommend a two-stage operation in these patients. Do you think some of the the poor outcome is because you do primary closure of the skin in that original study? And could you help by doing a delayed primary closure of the skin? Well, in that study, the skin was left open, and the plans were made for a delayed primary closure. I see. But you do primary closure at this time or not? Uh, so in the second stage, we do primary closure after three to five days of IV antibiotics, after the foot infection has been removed. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about venous thromboembolic disease. So, first of all, you've got, you, you kind of already mentioned it uh, tangentially, you've got lots of new drugs available to treat these patients, uh, the factor 10A, the, the thrombin, uh, oral drugs, do you have a favorite of these new oral anticoagulants? Well, in general, we recommend one of these agents is covered by the patient's insurance plan, and that is highly, highly, highly specific to the insurance plan and not the patient. Most of the insurance plans seem to approve either rivaroxaban, which is Xeralto, or apixaban, which is eloquus. And these can be started without um, initial parenteral anticoagulation. So these are the ones that I've got the most experience with. Okay, well, let me, uh, let me give you some patients and let's see, let's talk about what you would recommend. So you've got a popliteal vein thrombosis in a 52-year-old woman after an uncomplicated laparoscopic cholecystectomy. What kind of treatment does she get? Well, this is considered an isolated DVT provoked by surgery. So I'd recommend one of the direct oral anticoagulant agents, either the rivaroxaban or the apixaban, beginning immediately and continuing for three months. For three months? Yeah. The guidelines from the American College of Chest Physicians suggest long-term use of aspirin, 81 milligrams daily after three months, but I think that that is based on uh, relatively uh, low evidence. Okay. Well, how about an isolated calf vein thrombosis in a healthy 36-year-old man after an ankle sprain? Well, this, this is somewhat debatable between surveillance and anticoagulation. The American College of Chest Physician Guidelines, which I think are the most uh, worthwhile guidelines to guide our therapy, recommend anticoagulation for patients who have elevated D-dimer levels, a thrombus that's greater than 5 centimeters in length, 
or a thrombus in multiple calf veins, uh, the presence of cancer or immobility, or a thrombus that's close to the popliteal vein. Does the patient have any of those? No. Does the patient have symptoms? Uh, yeah, his ankle hurts. Uh, but not symptoms related to the DVT in the calf? No. In that case, I'd recommend observation with serial imaging for two weeks. Okay, all right. Let's try another one then. A second episode of superficial femoral vein thrombosis in a 62-year-old female breast cancer patient who is also on tamoxifen. Well, should we assume that the patient has active cancer? Uh, no. He, she is uh, out far enough from her cancer that uh, she is considered cure, but she's getting her hormonal therapy for her 10-year period, as recommended by the guidelines. Obviously, tamoxifen can be associated with an increased risk of DVT, but I'd be concerned that this might be a marker for cancer recurrence. In any event, this is her second episode, and so the main recommendation is that she should be anticoagulated indefinitely due to the second episode of DVT. The question is which agent to use. Patients who have DVT associated with active cancer should probably be treated with low molecular weight heparin uh, for three months. But the fact that there's a second DVT episode as the primary problem in this patient suggests that the patient could probably have one of the direct oral anticoagulant agents because they have equal efficacy compared with warfarin uh, and a reduced risk of bleeding. So I would treat this patient indefinitely on either Xeralto or Eliquis. And one more. Superficial thrombophlebitis at the knee in a 56-year-old perimenopausal woman who fell and bruised her lower extremity seven days ago. Well, um, in general, uh, the, the treatment for superficial thrombophlebitis has changed a lot. A lot of it is based on a randomized prospective study that evaluated simply using non anti-inflammatory agents and the application of heat compared with Fondipirinux, uh, 2.5 milligrams sub-Q daily for 45 days. And there was found to be a lower incidence of DVT, recurrent superficial thrombophlebitis, and symptoms uh, with the Fondipirinux. Uh, whether or not you use Fondipirinux, low molecular weight heparin, an oral anticoagulation agent uh, like Xeralto, I think has not been shown. So in most cases, we would specifically go on the evidence and recommend the Fondipirinux for 45 days. Now, that is a subcutaneous injection for superficial thrombophlebitis, so we have to kind of look at the patient and make sure that they're going to be compliant on that, on that regimen. That's a great review of the evidence and also a, a great comment about uh, committing your patient with superficial thrombophobitis to injections of fondoparinix for 45 days. Uh, not something that I think many patients would be very compliant with, I bet. As usual, every CSAP I learn something new. And so there's a syndrome that we talk about in CSAP 17 called endothermal heat-induced thrombosis, E-H-I-T. Totally new to me. Uh, so what is it? Can I prevent it? Uh, can I treat it? Uh, yes and yes. E-HIT uh, occurs after saphenous vein ablation using either radio frequency or laser heat sources. As you know, the, the ablation creates a burn on the endothelial surface of the vein that induces a thrombus in the treated vein segment. If the thrombus extends from the large saphenous vein into the femoral vein or from the small saphenous vein into the popliteal vein, then the patient has really developed DVT with a risk for PE. Now, this is reported to occur in about 1.5 to 5% of patients depending upon the type of um, heat source used. To prevent it, is, it's usually a technical problem. In, in general, during the ablation treatment, the saphenofemoral or the saphenopopliteal junction should be avoided. This means don't put wires into the femoral or, or popliteal vein. Don't put catheters into the femoral popliteal vein. And the ablation should not begin any closer than two centimeters distal to the respective junction. So if you can keep your ablation two centimeters away from it, the risk of e-hit is much, much less than if it gets any closer. 
In every case, we do a completion ultrasound at the end of the procedure that should be performed in the procedure room. And then the patient should return in 48 to 72 hours for a follow-up ultrasound to be sure that the thrombus is not extended into the deep system. To treat it, uh, really it depends upon how far the thrombus has extended into the deep venous system. And a convenient classification scheme has been recommended. In class one, the thrombus extends up to the junction, but actually hasn't gone into the deep system. Those are usually treated just with monitoring an aspirin, 81 or 325 milligrams a day. Class two, the thrombus actually extends into the deep system, but creates less than a 50% of occlusion in the deep vein. So it sort of bulges in without actually coming into contact with the entire venous wall. And those can also be treated with aspirin 81 or 325 milligrams daily. Class 3 E-HIT extends into the deep vein and creates a greater than 50% occlusion, while class 4 creates an occlusive DVT. Class 3 and class 4 patients should be treated with systemic anticoagulation. It can be used with a, either a warfarin or one of the novel oral anticoagulant agents. And systemic anticoagulation continues until the thrombus retracts caudal to the saphenofemoral saphenopopliteal junction, which happens most of the times. So anticoagulation is continued for probably at least six weeks with serial imaging until you see that the thrombus has retracted. You said it's one to one and a half percent of patients who receive either laser or heat to have their varices treated. And how many of those really go on to full-blown deep venous thrombosis, the, the class 3 and class 4? I don't have an immediate answer for that. The overall prevalence is, is as high as 5% with the majority being class 1 and class 2. I don't have an actual number of the ones who extend into the deep venous system and cause complete occlusion of the femoral vein or the popliteal vein, but it's exceedingly low. Okay. All right. I got to ask you about one of your specific questions that's in CSAP 17, which is a great question. And I'm going to give you a, a syndrome and uh, ask you for a definition and a, an approach for treatment. So the the first one is superior vena cava syndrome. Okay. Occlusion of the superior vena cava, uh, either due to scarring or intrinsic compression, occurs about 60% of the time due to malignancy, and the remainder are due to intervascular catheters or indwelling cardiac devices such as pacemaker leads. Symptoms of this are pretty obvious and include extensive face and neck swelling, headache, dyspnea, and cough. Malignant causes are treated with radiation with or without chemotherapy. In the scarring from the indwelling devices, it's important to remove the indwelling device if you can and initiate anticoagulation. Um, there has been some um, excellent outcomes, at least on a temporary basis, using balloon venoplasty or even placement of a large stent in the supreme vena cava. But anticoagulation needs to be continued. So let me ask you a specific question that that seems to come up in the intensive care unit. So you have a long-term patient. They have a central venous catheter. They've been catheterized plenty of times, and uh, the last catheter that put in is the the last one uh, that seemed to be open since the other side seems to already have clotted. And then you develop clot in the vein that's now being used by the central venous catheter. You mentioned removing that catheter, if at all possible. Is Can you leave it an anticoagulant? Well, I think the standard of care now is that you can leave those catheters in place as long as the patient can be fully anticoagulated and probably we'd recommend continuous unfractionated heparin in that case. Obviously, that patient needs to be followed and to make sure that the, the involved extremity edema improves. But generally speaking, uh, you don't have to remove the catheter if it's absolutely needed. How about another one? How about Paget-Schrader syndrome? Well, this is compression of the subclavian vein at the level of the thoracic outlet, usually between the clavicle and first rib. It's usually associated with uh, an enlarged or congenitally abnormal subclavius tendon or a large Halstead ligament. Compression in this area can lead to axillary subclavian vein thrombosis, 
and it's often seen in weightlifters and sports enthusiasts, so it's also called effort thrombosis. Presenting symptoms are arm pain and swelling, and treatment consists of uh, lysing the thrombus, followed by surgical decompression of the vein with the first rib resection. The timing of the first rib resection is somewhat debatable, but in general, we would proceed pretty quickly after the lysis has been completed, usually within a day or two. Uh, Some people uh, recommend waiting six weeks to allow the inflammatory reaction to recede. And then ultimately, you need to look at the, the vein, and if there's a chronic stenosis in the area where it's been extrinsically compressed, then that vein may need to be dealt with either using an open technique or more probably using an endovenous technique, balloon venoplasty. Now, wait a minute. I mean, can't we just lice the clot and then do an endovascular stint across the area of concern? Well, that's been tried, but unfortunately, if you don't relieve the compressing influence, the extrinsic compression, there's a, been a lot of reports of stent fracture and, and recurrent symptoms and recurrent paget schroeder syndrome. So you need to remove the extrinsic compression before you put the stent in. Okay. All right, how about another one? How about nutcracker syndrome? Well, this is um, something that's gaining a lot of attention. This is compression of the left renal vein between the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery, much like the duodenal compression syndrome uh, that we have talked about in general surgery for years. The symptoms of the vascular syndrome, the left renal vein compression, include left flank and abdominal pain, It's often accompanied by gross or microscopic hematuria. Men may develop left testicular pain and scrotal varices, and women often develop pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, and dyspareunia. Treatment options include left renal vein transposition and venous stenting. Um, In most cases of young patients, we would recommend renal vein transposition where we actually move the renal vein further down on the vena cava towards the vena cava confluence which takes it away from the compressing area. Treatment, uh, in this case, venous stenting in a young patient is is we don't recommend just because we don't know the long-term durability of venous stent, say, in a 30-year-old patient. Uh, We don't know if uh, 40 to 50 years that stent's going to remain patent. Now, it's been reported that some patients may experience spontaneous regression, but in general, the patients I see have had symptoms for a long time and are really miserable. And when you say you transpose the renal vein, do you you need a graft to get the length, or can it be done without adding adding an extra piece of vein to the renal vein? Most of the time that that, uh, I have done it, it has been done without having to add an extra piece of vein. That means you probably need to mobilize the vein further by ligating the Uh, adrenal and gonadal veins, which also takes away the pelvic um, congestion part of the syndrome. Occasionally, we've had to use a piece of um, interposition vein, and the vein that works best in that position, again, is the femoral popliteal vein. That seems like a lot of work for a relatively small benefit, but that seems to be the better size match. Okay. And one more, May Thurner syndrome. This is compression of the left common iliac vein between the right common iliac artery and the sacral promontory or the fifth lumbar vertebra. That anatomy is very strange, but if you look at an anatomy book, it'd be pretty obvious that the left common iliac vein crosses underneath the right common iliac artery in that area. Although many individuals have some degree of compression and are asymptomatic, symptoms develop when the compression results in hemodynamic changes that lead to either flow reversal or development of varices. Chronic compression can lead to thrombosis, and the most common presentation is acute iliofemoral DVT that manifests as leg swelling. Treatment consists of anticoagulation, then clot lysis, and placement of a self-expanding stent to relieve the compression. So in this location, the stent does work, versus Paget-Schrader, it doesn't work. So in Paget-Schrader syndrome, There's an extrinsic compression that's mostly uh, a bony compression that's uh, overridden by a ligamentous or muscular compression. In this case, the stent is able to kind of push the right common iliac artery anteriorly, and it seems to have long-term durability. Now, you mentioned iliofemoral thrombosis. At least at our institution, we have uh, started using thrombolysis to treat this. Is that... 
Is that something you use, and is it something that we should consider when most of the time we've treated those patients with anticoagulation? Yes, I think uh, the iliofemoral DVT is better treated that way. The patients seem to have better long-term outcomes. They are cleared relatively rapidly. We would use pharmacomechanical means. We'd probably use both lytic therapy and some type of mechanical thrombectomy, probably with an angiojet to remove the clot. In many cases, there's an underlying, especially on the left side, there's an underlying stenosis that can be corrected at the same time. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to stay on the venous system, and uh, I've got a topic that uh, I've actually saved for last, okay, since I know there's so much consensus on how to use them, and that's IVC filters. First of all, placement is usually been with radiologic guidance of some sort, but there's a lot of papers about bedside placement of these devices. Uh, Any experience or thoughts? Well, I've not had personal experience placing these devices at bedside, but I would note that imaging is really important to establish the exact location of the renal veins for proper placement and to ensure that the, the device is completely deployed and properly aligned. Um, I've had the opportunity to retrieve some filters that were placed under ultrasound guidance at the bedside and noted a number of instances involving filter tilting and distal misplacement way down by the um, vena cava confluence. Um, So I don't plan to change my practice. I still use fluoroscopy and intravascular ultrasound, occasionally needing to use venography when I can't absolutely be sure that I've gotten the renal vein location um, exactly pinpointed. When do you use these devices? With our new anticoagulants, uh, you know, except for somebody who has a major bleed on an anticoagulation drug, is there there any reason we should be using many of these now? Well, you know, the indications seem to change every year. Basically, I stick to the old conservative indications, such as recurrent venothromboembolic disease on anticoagulation that's adequate, patients who have a contraindication to anticoagulation or um, complications um, that require the anticoagulation to be stopped. There are a number of relative indications such as recurrent or massive PE, free-floating iliocable thrombus, and protection before instituting pharmacological therapy for DVT, in other words, before you do lytic therapy in the uh, iliofemoral system. But these really are controversial and probably no longer represent indications. Prophylactic filter placement is also controversial, with recent sentiment turning away from placing filters prophylactically in trauma, surgery, or medical patients who are deemed to be at high risk for DVT. So you're right. I think that those once relative indications have not been considered solid indications for placement of filters anymore. All right. So I got to ask the usual question, which is uh, the devices do keep changing, and now we have retrievable devices. When you put one in, are you putting in retrievable devices or using non-retrievable devices? Well, that's a great question. And in general, we'd recommend retrievable filters in order to avoid long-term complications of IVC thrombosis, stent migration, and strut perforation. But in our experience and that of others, the retrievable filters actually become non-retrievable because significantly less than 30% of patients actually return for filter removal despite being given appointments and scheduling retrieval procedures. Have you actually ever retrieved one? Just out of curiosity, because I, too, have your same experience, and I have never retrieved one. Oh, I've retrieved many uh, filters. Usually it's in patients who have not yet been discharged after the retrievable filter has been placed. Where we have problems are patients who are generally have a few comorbidities and are generally healthy who just sort of don't want to come back and have another procedure, particularly where they have their neck stuck to have the filter retrieved through the internal jugular vein. So the retrieval process is not that difficult? No, it's not at all. Okay. The thing that makes it hard is if the filter has been left in uh, more than six weeks or for sure more than six months. That means that the filter has generally been fixed to the vena cava wall and there's a lot of other things that need to be done, sometimes using laser therapy to get the filter out. Okay. 
Before we leave the inferior vena cava, Jim, I, I want to ask you about a trauma patient. So, and that really relates to a massive injury of uh, inferior vena cava and whether we can ligate the inferior vena cava with impunity uh, or should we spend our time trying to reconstruct it. What's your view on that? I assume that this is all inferenal? Yes, it's all inferenal. And the iliac veins are intact? Iliac veins are intact. This is a, a blast injury to the IVC between the renals and the iliac veins. Um, I assume that the patient is hemodynamically uh, abnormal? The patient has been hemodynamically abnormal. I now have control of the two ends of the vena cava. And there's no other injuries besides the vena cava injury? Uh, there's a couple of bowel injuries that have been repaired. In general, to get that patient off the table, I'd recommend just uh, ligating the vena cava, which means over sewing both ends of the vena cava and assuming that the collateral circulation uh, would take over promptly. The question is whether the patient should be anticoagulated postoperatively, and if possible, I'd probably recommend that. Okay. Now I have a little twist on that, and that I, I think uh, we're right at the renals, and I want to repair it, but what vein do I use? Because you mentioned I've got to use autogenous tissue. So what, what vein do I use to put an interposition graft in the IVC? In a scenario like this, where the patient has multiple injuries and may not be doing well uh, from a hemodynamic standpoint, I don't think I'd take the time to take the femoral veins out of the thigh. I think that would take hours, and that would also uh, risk um, other problems. So generally speaking, I think that if you can put a, uh, a large, probably PTFE graft in and wrap it, it's assuming there's not a lot of spill in the abdomen, that might be the best option here. If you have a cryopreserved aorta, that might be another uh, option, although many hospitals don't keep regular frozen um, allograft on hand all the time. We do here at the University of uh, Minnesota because we're a big transplant center, but also because we have a lot of uses for the cryopreserved artery. Well, when you go to the trauma books, I'm supposed to do a spiraled saphenous vein interposition graft. Isn't that right? Well, we've done that. The problem is it takes a long time and it takes a lot of vein to uh, replace a relatively short segment of IVC. I imagine, for example, if you were to take to need to fix a, an 8-centimeter length of IVC, that would probably take two saphenous veins to do that. And a lot of... Uh, a lot of time. A lot of time and a lot of bad words around the operating table, I bet. so That would be without doubt. <laughs> okay. Well, Jim, I see, unfortunately, our, our time is up this morning, but I, I have two questions for you. You mentioned that you're at an academic institution and have an academic vascular surgery practice. And our vascular surgeons are bemoaning how, how they're going to educate the current crop of vascular surgeons in open techniques. You got an answer for that difficult question in, in your program? Well, let's, let's not find a controversial area. Uh, <laughs> in general, I would say that vascular surgery as a specialty has become far removed from usual general surgery training in many programs. And that's because general surgery training really has upped its game in terms of what needs to be done to train general surgeons in a lot of procedures they're going to be doing in their practice. So vascular surgery rotations fall away as required rotations. There are some people, obviously, who are going to be facing or who want to do vascular surgery in a general surgery practice. And in most cases, we would recommend that that person take a vascular fellowship uh, in order to be able to do that. But it seems like that's two years of, of time that may not justify what's going to actually be done in practice. There have been some suggestions that there may be some shorter fellowships that some of the vascular surgeons have termed vascular light uh, that may allow people, for example, in the military 
to take some basic training in vascular surgery that they can take with them to the battlefield and ultimately into practice maybe in rural areas where vascular surgeons are not immediately available. But those fellowships and training programs don't currently exist. Well, Jim, before I leave you, I, I want to ask you a very specific question about being a CSAP author. So you have been a CSAP author in the past. Uh, you went away, you were doing other things, and uh, you were kind enough to agree to come back. And I just ask you your perspective on those two experiences. Uh, are we doing what we should be doing? Are we doing it better? Give us your perspective. Well, I think it's it's better. And from that standpoint, I mean, it's better use of time, better use of the committees to look at questions. What I've been amazed at is how much surgery changes from CSAP to CSAP. I think having a CSAP come out every three years is probably a good time interval because I think there's been so many things that have changed in the areas that general surgeons often see. Well, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm always amazed at how much things change from CSAP to CSAP. And uh, once again, Jim, I, I, I know I've kept you a little over today, but I really appreciate you spending some time with me and talking about vascular problems that a general surgeon still may face. And uh, I just thank you for volunteering to be a member of our CSAP 17 process. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. That's it for this category of the CSAP-17 Audio Companion. The issues expressed by the CSAP-17 Audio Companion represent solely the views of the contributors, authors, and commentators, and do not necessarily represent the views of the American College of Surgeons or Oakstone. These conversations are not intended to represent exhaustive dissertations on the topics discussed. Medication uses and dosages should be confirmed with current reference material. We hope you have found this program to be both enjoyable and enlightening. The CSAP 17 Audio Companion is copyright 2019 by the American College of Surgeons.